Hey, welcome back. Today we're looking at Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, chapters 21 through 23, where the repercussions of Victor denying the monster's request finally come out. But before we begin, I want to thank all my patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. And if you haven't visited my Patreon page yet, you ought to go over there. There's a lot of great resources to help you in the study of literature, including guided study questions to go along with Frankenstein and other works. When we left off in chapter 20, Victor had finally reversed his decision to fulfill the monster's request. He had destroyed his work on the second monster, and he had basically defied the monster to its face. After disposing of the evidence and sailing out, he eventually arrives in Ireland, where he is immediately arrested for murder. Chapter 21 unpacks the entire situation with the murder. He is brought before a magistrate, who then hears all of the evidence in this first hearing. A body was found by a few fishermen, and one of them noticed a small boat that looked very much like Victor's, just outside in the water. At first they thought that the dead man had drowned, but upon closer inspection they found that he had been strangled and that there were fingerprints on his neck. Victor listened to all of this with relative disinterest at first, until they got to the detail about the strangulation, at which he became very upset, considering that this is the same way that his brother William died. And he begins to suspect that the creature is involved. Seeing his agitation, the judge decides to bring him before the body to see if he recognizes it. When the body is uncovered, Victor discovers to his horror that this is Henry Clerval. Now we knew Henry was going to die, there was lots of foreshadowing to that effect, but here is Victor's friend, completely destroyed before him, thanks to his decision with the monster. Victor screams a whole lot of self-incriminating things and then collapses into a fever that lasts for several months again. In his fever, he raves about the monster and about his guilt over William and Justine and Henry. When he finally recovers enough to speak, Mr. Kerwin, the magistrate, comes and speaks to him. And Mr. Kerwin's actually a really nice guy and also somewhat sympathetic with Victor in spite of the evidence that makes him look a little bit incriminating. And Mr. Kerwin reveals that he found some papers on Victor, including the address of his father, to whom he has currently written. Victor is immediately terrified, because after being out for a few more months, what has the monster done? Who else has he killed? It turns out the monster hasn't apparently killed anyone else. There isn't some big crime spree revealed at this point. But when the magistrate tells him that he has a friend waiting to speak with him, Victor flips out, thinking it's the creature. This isn't the first time he's jumped to these wildly guilty conclusions. He did the same thing when he came to, and Henry first talked to him after the, his initial breakdown after creating the creature. Where he says, oh no, don't talk to me about the creature! And Henry's like, actually, I was just going to talk to you about your mail. And he also did the same thing when his father confronted him about his mopiness. He's like, oh no, you want to talk to me about the creature! But no, he, his dad just wanted to talk to him about his relationship with Elizabeth. His guilty conscience makes him kind of paranoid. It has throughout the whole book, and it seems to just be getting worse. However, the friend who's come to speak with him is actually his father, who is heartbroken over his situation. They hoped that he would have a great time in England with Henry, and then come back recovered and marry Elizabeth. And instead, we are inflicted with more tragedy and despair, and here, he's being accused of murder. However, the trial goes pretty smoothly, because there is evidence that he was on the Orkney Islands during the murder, and so therefore he's got an alibi, and everything's okay. And Victor is then released to return home with his father. But Victor is pretty broken at this point. All he can think about is the tragedies that he's experienced, the grief he has over Henry, and his own sense of guilt that is just crushing him. He started drinking laudanum every night, and he's haunted by horrible dreams, and he keeps, like, breaking down and confessing to all these murders, saying, I'm responsible for their deaths! But he still won't tell why. He still won't confess that he created this creature that's going around killing people now. He says everyone will just think he's mad, which, I mean, most people are beginning to worry about his continual breakdowns anyway. But he also doesn't want to inflict the horror of this terrifying tale on anyone. So he's just going to keep it in and keep 
having these little breakdowns over and over again. There's nothing that anyone, especially his father, can say that will make him feel better and help him to get over this. He also, throughout chapters 21 through 23, keeps talking about how he wishes he could have just died, but somehow he keeps surviving everything. This is a key concept that we're going to explore as we get to the end of the book. Why does Victor continue living when tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy crush him and bear him down? We saw that clinging to life as he was almost swept out in a storm in his little boat, but now the weight of life just keeps bearing down on him. He wonders why so many other people die when he just keeps living and he's the one who's responsible for it all. Doesn't seem fair. On their way home, he gets a letter from Elizabeth which is her asking if he still wants to marry her. After all this time, it seems like there's so many awful things happening, and he really has been so standoffish for the past several years, does he even still want to marry her? You well know, Victor, that our union has been the favorite plan of your parents ever since our infancy. We were told this when young and taught to look forward to it as an event that would certainly take place. We were affectionate playfellows during childhood, and I believe, dear, and valued friends to one another as we grew older. But as brother and sister often entertain a lively affection towards each other without desiring a more intimate union, may not such also be our case? Tell me, dearest Victor, answer me, I conjure you by our mutual happiness with simple truth. Do you not love another? You have traveled, you have spent several years of your life in Ingolstadt, and I confess to you, my friend, that when I saw you last autumn so unhappy, flying to solitude, and from society of every creature, I could not help supposing that you might regret our connection, and believe yourself bound in honor to fulfill the wishes of your parents, although they oppose themselves to your inclinations. But this is a false reasoning. I confess to you, my friend, that I love you, and that in my airy dreams of futurity, you have been my constant friend and companion. But it is your happiness I desire as well as my own, when I declare to you that our marriage would render me eternally miserable, unless it were the dictate of your own free choice. And so Elizabeth offers him an out. You don't have to marry me if you don't want to. Remember that that was the warning of the creature as well. When the creature faced off with Victor over his denial of the creature's request, the creature said, okay, I will have my revenge. I will be with you on your wedding night. And Victor misinterpreted that as that's the moment that the creature is going to kill him, even though that wasn't even remotely in the statement that the creature said. As soon as Victor gets this letter from Elizabeth, he recalls the warning of his creature, and he's overcome with all of these emotions about it. Here's poor Elizabeth, who he's been neglecting and ignoring for all of this time, and who it just was assumed that he would marry, and she's offering him this opportunity to break it off. But he sees the wedding as his final confrontation with the creature, and therefore it needs to happen, and he needs to hurry it along. Not because he's going to have any joy in marrying Elizabeth, and not because he's going to bring her any joy, because he assumes the creature will kill him that day. But he also notices how the creature didn't wait to wreak revenge, but immediately went and killed Clairval. And so if he puts off the wedding, the creature may just stalk his family and kill them one by one. I resolve, therefore, that if my immediate union with my cousin would conduce either to hers or my father's happiness, my adversary's designs against my life should not retard it a single hour. And so he writes back to Elizabeth and he says, Oh, uh, I don't expect to ever, ever, ever be happy again. But yes, let's get married. I also have this horrible dark secret that I can't tell you about that's haunting me and ruining my life, but I promise I'll tell it to you on our wedding night. Well, that's cheerful. Poor Elizabeth. Victor's such a depressed misery. And yet, she's going to get sucked into this relationship even deeper. And so he gets home and he sees Elizabeth. And she seems very changed, sadder, less vitality. But she's trying to give everything to him and comfort him and encourage him. And he's still his moody, miserable self. And Victor's dad says, I guess you want to go ahead with the wedding? And Victor's like, yes, let's get married. <laughs> And his dad reminds him that although they've experienced all this tragedy already, yet they should look to the future with hope and happiness. You know, someday they'll have children and, and uh, more relationships to bring them joy that will help comfort them in the loss of their past. Such were the lessons of my father. 
but to me the remembrance of the threat returned. Nor can you wonder that, omnipotent as the fiend had been in his deeds of blood, I should almost regard him as invincible, and that when he had pronounced the words, I shall be with you on your wedding night, I should regard the threatened fate as unavoidable. But death was no evil to me. If the loss of Elizabeth were balanced with it, and I therefore, with a contented and even cheerful countenance, agreed with my father, that if my cousin would consent, the ceremony should take place in ten days, and thus put, as I imagined, the seal to my fate. So he agrees, let's go ahead and knock it out, we'll do it in ten days from now. Um, but again, it's, it's him assuming that this is his own fate, the creature's coming for him, the creature's coming for him. And then there's this little foreshadowing bit that he drops here, which again, reveals how stupid Victor has been up to this point. Great God, if for one instant I had thought what might be the hellish intention of my fiendish adversary, I would have banished myself forever from my native country and wandered a friendless outcast over the earth, then have consented to this miserable marriage. But as if possessed of magic powers, the monster had blinded me to his real intentions, and when I thought that I had prepared only my own death, I hastened that of a far dearer victim. And so they rush along in their preparations and have the wedding ceremony. The whole time, Victor is fake happy, and Elizabeth is getting more and more miserable. She can feel how very dark his sentiments are, and that there's this dark looming secret. And she's trying to deal with all of this, poor Elizabeth, but she's also knowing that something is seriously wrong. And he's like strapping a dagger and a pistol to himself as they're getting ready to go on their honeymoon. And they're going to um, an estate that was once owned by her family and that they've managed to recover after all of her family's property was lost. Elizabeth seemed happy. My tranquil demeanor contributed greatly to calm her mind. But on the day that was to fulfill my wishes and my destiny, she was melancholy. And a presentiment of evil pervaded her. And perhaps also she thought of the dreadful secret which I had promised to reveal to her on the following day. They're married, they start sailing off on their honeymoon, and again, they're you know, observing the beauty of the world around them, which characters do throughout this book, but also you can see that Elizabeth is bearing the weight of all this. And how does Victor comfort her? He says, you are sorrowful, my love. Ah, if you knew what I have suffered and what I may yet endure, you would endeavor to let me taste the quiet and freedom from despair that this one day at least permits me to enjoy. Victor, I can't stand you right now. I kind of want to wring your neck. So in this moment, he's like, honey, you're looking sad. I know I'm, I've been super moody and grumpy and awful for the past seven, eight years, but I kind of wish you would cheer up a little bit and give me a smile so I could enjoy this one moment because I'm about to be miserable for the rest of my life. Come on, dude! And Elizabeth attempts to cheer him up. And he feels a little bit lighter until they land their boat and get ready to go up to the little villa. And he says, The sun sunk beneath the horizon as we landed, and as I touched the shore, I felt those cares and fears revive, which soon were to clasp me and cling to me forever. And so it comes to their wedding night, and Victor's all, like, paranoid, and he's getting ready to, like, he's looking around, ready to see, fight the monster when the monster appears. I was anxious and watchful, with my right hand grasped a pistol which was hidden in my bosom. Every sound terrified me, but I resolved that I would sell my life dearly and not shrink from the conflict until my own life or that of my adversary was extinguished. And Elizabeth obviously notices how crazy he's acting and she's like can you are you okay everything all right and he's like oh yes just this one night is so dreadful so dreadful and so she goes on up to the bedroom and he starts walking around like stalking the house waiting for the creature to appear but he just can't see any trace of the creature until all of a sudden there's a scream from the bedroom as i heard it the whole truth rushed into my mind. My arms dropped. The motion of every muscle and fiber was suspended. I could feel the blood trickling in my veins and tingling in the extremities of my limbs. This state lasted for but an instant. The scream was repeated, and I rushed into the room. Great God, why did I not then expire? Why am I here to relate the destruction of the best hope, the purest creature of Earth? She was there, lifeless and inanimate, thrown across the bed, her head hanging down and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. Everywhere I turn, I see the same figure, 
her bloodless arms and relaxed form flung by the murderer on its bridal bier. Could I behold this and live? Alas, life is obstinate and clings closest where it is most hated. For a moment only did I lose recollection. I fell senseless on the ground. Well, we saw this one coming. And so the creature's revenge has struck. And the creature has taken from Victor what he loves most in the world, his closest and dearest companion. And now Victor is very alone. Victor faints for a while, and then we have the bustle of all the inn people who are panicked and upset by the murder. And a few minutes later, Victor looks up at the window and he sees the creature's face grinning at him and pointing at the body of his wife. Victor pulls out his pistol and tries to take a shot, but the creature is gone. Everyone dashes around chasing after the murderer, but when he's not found, Victor rushes back in to where the body of Elizabeth is. And suddenly in his agitation, he recognizes the creature is probably not going to stop here. It's going to run home and kill the rest of my family too. And so Victor runs like a madman down and grabs a boat and starts paddling back to Geneva before the emotional torpor just causes him to collapse. He makes it back home and again doesn't find a scene of desolation. There's his father, Fine, as well as his brother, Ernest. But when he tells his father what happened to Elizabeth, the old man is so shaken by this that he breaks down and collapses and a few days later dies in bed. Victor himself slips into another one of his breakdowns and fever fits, which lasts some time until he finally is able to recover again. And Victor is again locked up in a dungeon while he rages crazily for some time. When he finally recovers his senses and is released, he rushes to find a magistrate who will help him hunt down the true murderer of his family. And all he has left is this desire for revenge. And the magistrate hears that he has information about the murderer, and so for the first time, Victor finally tells his story and tells about the creature. And the magistrate listens in some awe, but when he comes to the end of his story, it's clear that the magistrate does not believe him or truly give any credit to his story. And the man tries to kind of talk Victor down, thinking he's crazy. He says, well, you know, it would be impossible to hunt such a creature, first of all. And he tries to soften things for him. And after all, it's been some months since the creature killed. And Victor, recognizing that he's going to get no help, then swears he's going to find that creature and get revenge, no matter what. And so we come to the end of chapter 23. We'll find out what Victor is going to do now that his family has been destroyed in the last part of the book. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another video or to visit my Patreon page where I have a whole lot of great resources for you. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.